today, uh, Ron Brown, after decades spent traveling the world and picking up university degrees from J Jerusalem, Harvard, and Geneva, Dr. Ron Brown settled in New York City in 1992. He has been teaching history, eth ethnic studies, and political science at Turo College and world religions at the Unification Theological Seminary for over 25 years. He has been deeply involved in the cultural life of New York City through his work as a featured speaker at the New York Historical Society, New York Council for the Humanities, and, the, and numerous other libraries, historical societies, colleges, and universities. So and without further ado, here is Ron Brown. Well, thank you very much, Michelle, and welcome, everybody. I uh, hope everybody is staying healthy and staying safe with this pandemic. I just got back from Mexico last weekend where I said after one year of not being able to travel, <clears throat> I was going to take a vacation. So I flew to Mexico City for a week, then down to Cancun and uh, the archeological ruins in the um, Yucatan, and then back to Mexico City. Well, I left on the 23rd, and as probably as a lot of you know, as of the 26th, anybody flying into the United States from anywhere in the world has to have the test. And uh, so I got in just in time. But I'll tell you, it was an experience living in Mexico uh, for a couple of weeks and seeing how the pandemic is ravaging a relatively poor country. When you consider the United States is not doing a very good job, even with our highly sophisticated medical system, uh, might not be ideal, but at least we're dealing with it. Whereas in Mexico, I mean, with all of the uh, sort of floating population, people who survive by selling trinkets on the street, they can't lock down, they can't stay home or else the family doesn't eat. So that was really quite an experience. I'm thinking of doing a PowerPoint on Mexico under lockdown, but that'll be for some time in the future. So our topic for today is a city where exactly one year ago, I was in Brazil. That was my last year's vacation. Um, and then I came back just as the pandemic was hitting New York City. And so then for one year, I couldn't go anywhere until this January when I went to Mexico. So I don't know how many of you have been to Brazil or Brasilia, but it is really a continent. I mean, in one month, you can only see so much, but I definitely uh, saw as much as I could. But once again, this is the outline. As you all know, Brazil was a Portuguese colony. So it eventually got its independence. Well, a new Brazil. At the turn of the century, the early 1900s, Brazil was out to cut its ties with Europe and to create a new identity, a new empire. And that's the new Brazil. And the new capital, Brasilia, built in the jungle area, was going to be a monument to the new Brazil, no longer tethered to Portugal and Europe, but setting off on its own empire. Well, Brasilia, built in the jungle, really opened up the jungle to exploration. And as you know from the news, chopping down of trees, burning of the jungle, the rise of agriculture and farming. And then the whole concept of cities being built in the middle of nowhere as a new utopia. Brasilia was more than a city. It was a utopia of the future of Brazil and even a new human being, a Brazilian. And then other utopian visions of the future. So let's get going. Okay, there's me. Um, the guy in the center with his arms outstretched, that's Jesus. I'm the one standing in front with a tank top and holding a plastic bag. So here again, Rio, Copacabana Beach on the right, 
which is what everybody goes to see. Well, of course, I'm a teacher and a lecturer and whatnot, so, which is why I always travel alone, because sure, I can go to the beach, but after 10 minutes and the beach, I was ready to go to a museum or visit a church or do something historical. I started out my trip in Rio. I flew to Rio. Now, as you know, I always stay in these cheap hostels. Behind the tree there is a hostel at a dead end. And I always get a room with four other people. And you meet some fascinating people. I mean, it was filled with tourists from all over Europe. Gang of Koreans were there. Um, people from Argentina, Canada, and the United States. So wonderful thing about visiting Rio because, uh, or visiting any city, staying in hostels. That's what I did in Cancun, where I met all these COVID refugees who had no job in Europe or America or Canada and were just waiting out the COVID pandemic in a hostel in Cancun or Tulum. In the middle is me in Sao Paulo. This is one of the big evangelical movements. Brazil is in a war between the old established Catholic Church and these new evangelical Protestants. On the right is a temple claimed to be a reconstruction in even larger style of Solomon's temple, because you know the evangelical Christians are awaiting the second coming and the end of the world. So in San Paulo, they built this giant reproduction of Solomon's temple. So when Jesus comes back, he'll feel right at home. Now I ask a couple of Brazilians I met, do they expect Jesus to return in Brazil itself or was he gonna do in Jerusalem? Well, most of my Brazilian friends were sure that when Jesus returned, it was going to be to Sao Paulo. I mean, it couldn't be in Jerusalem or New York or Shanghai. So that's what I do on vacation. I go around visiting churches and temples and mosques and synagogues and interviewing people and um, getting to know the um, cultural, intellectual, and religious background of the country. So Rio for a week, then to Sao Paulo for a week, and then to Brasilia. Now, let's step back. Well, as you know, Portugal, as you can see, Portugal, Lusitania, that's where we get the name of the ship that went down. That was the old name, the old Roman name for what eventually became uh, Portugal. So it was on the extreme western coast of the Roman Empire. Well, the Romans pretty well fizzled out by the third century. Then you had the immigration of the Visigoths. These were the people uh, who were raping, pillaging, and plundering. From the fifth to the eighth century, they had the Visigothic Empire in Spain. The Muslims invaded it around 711 and stayed for almost a thousand years. So on the map, you see the Umayyad Caliphate. That's the one that built Cordova, Sevilla in the south, Toledo, all oh, Lisbon, all have Muslim ruins, churches, which were formerly mosques. Now, the Portuguese started sailing, and of course, they grabbed what is Brazil. Well, even though the Visigoths and the Muslims ruled Spain and Portugal, the Latin language remained deeply rooted in the people. And so you had the emergence of what we call the Romance languages, all deriving from Latin. Today we have Romanian, which is a Latin-based language, of course, Italian, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. These are the La uh, languages which emerged from um, uh, Latin. Now, we know in English we have French, but the French-speaking countries are called the Francophone countries. Spanish, well, they're the Span Hispanophone. Portuguese family of languages is what we call the Lusophone 
going back to the ancient Roman name for uh, uh, Portugal, which was Lusitania. So we have the Lusophone um, language family. Well, by the Renaissance, Portugal started emerging as a major power. We all know about Vasco da Gama in the 1400s sailing around Africa. Bartolomeo Diaz got to the Cape of Good Hope in 48, uh, 1488, and Vasco da Gama rounded the Cape of Good Hope, which was a Portuguese settlement, and went up and started exploring Asia. And that's why Portugal got so rich, because it was importing the spices from Asia, the gems, the silks from China. They were being imported by Portugal and then sold throughout Europe. So Portugal became the richest country in Europe in the 1400s. Well, you can't keep the Portuguese down. So they not only started going and exploring Asia and building colonies, but they decided to cross the Atlantic and they discovered in South America, the coast which became the root of the country today of Brazil. And so you see the map on the right, you see little Portugal on the uh, Spain there, sailing down across the equator and starting to claim lands which were Brazil. The Spanish followed and took the rest of Latin America, Mexico, the English started later on taking the 13 colonies, and then the French took over Quebec and area. So it was the big mad dash for colonies in America and Portugal got a big chunk. Here we see the map of the expansion of Brazil. By 1700, Brazil was pushing inland. Map on the right, you see the dark colored areas but gradually they were pushing in land. Now, by 1810, you had the uh, Spanish taking over Argentina and Paraguay and Uruguay. But if you look at the boundaries of, Portugal, of Brazil, you see it's very irregular because they were at war with the Spanish. Who's gonna grab what? How much is each person going to get? Well, there was no gold in Brazil. The main export products were, of course, sugar, which was made into rum. And so the giant uh, plantations of Brazil were very much like the plantations of the United States, producing cotton, tobacco, rice, sugar. Thousands of slaves were brought over from Africa, which you can see on the map on the right. Africa is really not that far away. So. Millions of slaves were brought over, put to work on the plantations. The second big product they had was cattle. Cattle was important because it was leather and meat. So that was the wealth of Brazil. It didn't have gold, it didn't have diamonds, it didn't have anything else like the Mexicans had gold and silver, Peru had gold and silver, but Brazil didn't have any of this. Most of it was forested um, and gradually uh, the Portuguese developed agriculture. Well, in 1822, Portugal got, uh, was occupied by Napoleon and gradually, and actually what happened when Napoleon occupied uh, Portugal, the king jumped on a ship with the royal family and fled to Brazil. Well, this was a major event where a country like Brazil would have an emperor. And so you had Emperor Pedro I and Pedro II. So even when the king of Portugal went back to Portugal, he left behind him a son, and that son was proclaimed Emperor Pedro I. So poor Brazil didn't have a war to get its independence like the United States did or Mexico or Argentina. The king of Portugal granted Brazil its independence 
under his son who became the emperor. So we don't really think of Brazil as being an empire. Well, we did have an emperor in Haiti. We had an emperor in Mexico. But in Brazil, the imperial family took root and you had two in the dynasty lasting from 1822 to 1889. When we think that the United States was in a civil war, Brazil had an emperor. And I mean, the Brazilians do it up in style. On the left, you see the royal palace in Rio de Janeiro, the first capital, the middle, every inch a king. I mean, an emperor with his medals. You had the Duke of Rio de Janeiro, princes and barons. It was an aristocracy. Over on the right, you see Pedro I. I mean, the, every inch an emperor, which really distinguishes Brazil from all of its neighbors. Haiti and Mexico had emperors, but they didn't last very long. Whereas Brazil, almost the entire 1800s, was dominated by an emperor. Well, for 76 years, an emperor ruled, the son of the king of Portugal. He was an equal with the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, the emperor of Portugal. Uh, of Austria, the King of England, he was one of them. And Brazil was very, very much oriented towards Europe. They spoke a European language, their royal family, the king, the emperor of Brazil was related to almost every king in Europe. He could go to um, uh, uh, Queen Victoria in England and address her as cousin Victoria. So the culture of Brazil was very, very Eurocentric. The empire left a very powerful influence. Well, gradually, as Brazil started moving into the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was a country of immigration, Huge numbers of Germans, of Italians, of French, of Brits, large African former slave population, large numbers of Spanish and, uh, and Portuguese. Is um, Brazil decided to try to reshape its identity? And this was the new Brazil. Look at the growth of population. 1900, 17 million today, well over 200 million. Large numbers of these are immigrants, large numbers of Americans after the defeat of the South in the Civil War, large numbers of uh, people, Americans from the Confederate South went to Brazil and settled there. So Brazil today, with 200 and almost 12 million people, ranks up there as a major world power. The United States, uh, 331 million. Germany, 83 million. I mean, uh, not even half the population of Brazil. Russia, 145 million, smaller than Brazil. Mexico, 129 million, smaller than Brazil. China, of course, with a billion and a half outranks Brazil. But by the 1900s, uh, Brazil started saying, well, we're no longer an annex to Europe. We are developing our own culture in the world. We are, after all, number six in population. So let's cut our ties with Portugal and Europe. The empire ended with the emperor being um, uh, resigning and it became a republic. So beginning already in the early 1900s, Brazil decided that it was no longer going to be oriented to Europe. If you look at the map on the left, you see the great cities, you see Rio, um, on, on the coast, Sao Paulo is within spitting distance of the coast. 
Um, Florianopolis is on the coast. Brazil decided to cut its ties with Europe and to turn its attention to Brazil. And central to that vision of a new Brazil was a new capital. Well, Brasilia was the brainchild of President um, Yuskalino Kubitschek. Here again, the name Kubitschek, it's a Czech name, Eastern European, reflecting the large numbers of Europeans who had migrated to Brazil um, over the centuries. He was president from 1956 to 1961. It was his vision of dragging Brazil away from Europe and creating its own civilization. Well, the 50s and the 60s were the golden age of skyscrapers, ultra modern architecture. It was Le Corbusier who was redesigning the cities of the future. Le Corbusier's term was the radiant city. Lucio Costa, who was a Brazilian um, urban planner, came up with an idea to create a brand new ultra modern city in the middle of the forests to show that Brazil was now a major country in the world, not part of Europe, not part of Asia, not part of the Middle East, but the future was in South America. On the left, you see Costa's plan for Brasilia. It's a butterfly, giant boulevards, blocks. And in the very center, the body of the butterfly was a giant commercial and administrative and entertaining city. This was a planned city. We see modernist utopia Brasilia, ultra modern architecture. On the right, you see an aerial view. I didn't take that, but they were selling them all over the place. Once again, you see the butterfly on a peninsula sticking out into a beautiful lake. Well, gradually it expanded. You see housing developments all around the lake and it was a planned city. Nothing was left to chance. There's me standing at the middle of the butterfly. And behind me, you see this giant monumental plaza filled with lakes and forests. And even still, the, a lot of the trees are still in the process of growing. Giant boulevards on either side, lined by government offices, churches. At the top of the picture, you see that uh, building with a um, white dome on top of it. That was the new Catholic Cathedral of uh, Brasilia. In the distance, you can see the lake. So we're right in the middle of the butterfly. Absolutely phenomenal view. Now, Brasilia is like Los Angeles in the sense that it is a car city. By the 50s and the 60s, everybody who was anybody in Brazil had a car. Well, I'm not a car person, which is why I live in New York, because I can walk everywhere or jump on the subway. But Brazil was a car city. Now, unfortunately, I walked from where I'm standing there in the picture the whole way down to the lake. Now, this was January, which was the Brazilian high summer. I must have drank 10 gallons of water and juice because of dehydration. It took me two hours to walk this stretch, but it was well worth it. You see the president's palace across from the cathedral. You see museums, government administrative offices. This is a planned city built in the middle of nowhere to symbolize the new Brazil. Now, of course, um, it was not really well planned. It was beautiful, it looked nice, but in all these big government buildings, they forgot to put restaurants. 
I guess uh, uh, Costa decided, well, uh, that will come later. So the interesting thing walking down that big boulevard is at noon, all these trucks pull up and they put out chairs and they have stands and that's where everybody goes out to have dinner because notice that they forgot to put administ uh, um, restaurants in all of these big administrative offices, which was probably good because the meals which were served were absolutely delicious. Now, below that, you see uh, um, Brasilia as a construction site. I mean, even today, everywhere you go, they're building new buildings rising out of mud and dirt. So the problem I had with Brasilia is that it's beautiful, it's monumental, it's impressive, but the architect sort of forgot about people. Giant towers are nice. Parking lots are nice, big boulevards and parks are nice, but it's not a user-friendly city for people like me who like to walk around downtown New York, Mexico. I go all over the old city, the Socolo, and you see a people-oriented city, a city built by people, whereas Brasilia was built by Costa, an idealistic architect and city planner. Now, the buildings themselves were designed by a um, Brazilian architect called Oscar Niemeyer. Niemeyer was a fascinating family. They entered when Brazil was growing in the 1400s, a German family by the name of Niemeyer migrated to Brazil. They became architects and engineers, and then a branch of the family migrated to Portugal, and Oscar um, was the descendant of one of these Portugal-based uh, German families. The building you see at the bottom left is the federal parliament. This would be our capital building. You see the two giant towers, and here it's very nice. It looks pretty. I mean, you have the dish, which is a big auditorium, and on the left, you see the dome, sort of like the House of Representatives on one side and the Senate on the other, set in a beautiful green area with a lake sprawling all over the place. At the top on the right, you see another one of these ultra-modern Corbusier-style buildings. They're beautiful to look at, but I find them cold. They're cement and glass and steel, but no warmth that you get from maybe wood or some decoration. And as you can see from the building uh, at the top, you look at the palm trees. I mean, they, that building was just finished and the palm trees are still growing. So it is very, very much a work in progress. This is the Catholic Cathedral, ultra modern. Um, uh, they have a museum on the side celebrating the architecture, the stained glass windows. Um, the previous building I said with the white dome, that's a, a museum, made a mistake. But this is the Catholic Cathedral. Now, the problem is nobody lives in that area. It's all government administrative buildings. So I went there to mass on Sunday and it was half empty because it's not a residential area. So it's more a monument than it is an actual cathedral. Even the architecture, it is, you could only call it monumental. And you enter through a downward ramp, which you can see on the left. So it is impressive, but here again, it is more monumental than it is functional. Everything was included. On the right, you see the National Theater, which is along the giant central axis parkway. Um, uh, it was a beautiful auditorium, ultra modern. And you can see sort of the influence of the jungle where it is or the uh, forested area because it is tropical. And so you see some really magnificent plants, which are gradually taking root and growing. On the left is a giant shopping center. 
Now, one of the problems with Brasilia is there are no ocean breezes to cool the place off. You are well inland. And so everything has to be air conditioned. I know, I'm a walker, so I was out walking around. I mean, every 10 minutes, I thought I was going to have a sunstroke because it was so bitterly hot, but it was well worth it. I mean, you see a city taking shape out of the mind of a person. I mean, uh, most cities that we know, New York, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Paris, London, you had an ancient city, many cases in Europe, going back to the Middle Ages, which was constantly being modernized, torn down, and built up. But when you go to lower Manhattan, for example, near Wall Street, you see these small, narrow streets dating from the Dutch period when everybody was using a horse and buggy. Well, Brasilia had no past. It was only looking toward the future. These are other views of it. On the right is the airport. Ultra modern rolling uh, walkways, even the bridges can't be just simple bridges. Everything has to be monumental to celebrate the future of Brazil. On the top, on the left, you see how flat the landscape is. No breezes, stifling hot in the summer. I don't know what it is like in the winter, which would be July or something. I should probably go down sometime. But here again, everything is white, gleaming, clean, clear, sparkling. And everything that is built is monumental. So Brasilia was the gateway to greatness. Now, Brazil was getting out under the sh of, from the shadow of the Anglophone world, the British Empire. Everybody in the British Empire still looks back to Great Britain. Even the United States and Britain have this special relationship. The queen is still the titular head of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. India adopted the British system of government. Judges in Africa still dress like the judges in Britain. The Hispanophone world, the upper right, these countries are still deeply rooted in French culture. They've adopted the French or the Spanish language. Um, the architecture of the cities of Latin America are always dominated by their Spanish Catholic cathedral. Uh, the people still look to Spain as the source of their culture. Same thing with the Francophone world. Quebec, large parts of Africa still accept French as their um, international language. They still have adopted Catholicism, French style, and still have deep roots in France. This is exactly what the Portuguese were trying to break away from. Now, these are the Lusophone countries. We tend to forget that little tiny Portugal built an empire. The official language of Brazil is Portuguese. Look at Africa, Mozambique, Angola, San Tome and Principal, Equatorial Guinea, Guinea-Bissau. These countries, Angola, are all Portuguese speaking. Macau in China is still a Portuguese speaking city. East Timor near Indonesia, Portuguese speaking. I spent a wonderful vacation in Goa, which still has a very Portuguese culture with a Portuguese cathedral. Brazil wanted nothing more to do with Portugal. And that's what Brazil was all about, breaking away from Portugal, charting its own destiny as a major world power.
Now, still, Portugal re and Brazil remain united by language. We tend to forget that Portuguese is one of the main languages of the world. You make a film in Brazil, it can be sold in half a dozen countries in Africa, in Portugal, in Goa, in Macau. And so you have the community of countries of the Portuguese language. Now, the Portuguese soap, uh, the Brazilian soap operas are very popular. I have a friend and she wanted to be a actress in a Portuguese um, or a Brazilian soap opera. And I mean, of course, she was very white skinned looking, like you could see the announcer on the South, very European oriented, spoke beautiful Portuguese. But I told her the only way you can really be successful in a Brazilian soap opera is to be able to cry nonstop for two hours because the Brazilians are very emotional speaking loud, aggressive. Uh, I found that the Portuguese, the, the Brazilians were as aggressive as New York City. I mean, try standing in line in Brazil. I mean, if you don't have good New York uh, elbows and you're not able to push your way forward, uh, you'll be at the end of the line um, for the rest of the day. The president of um, Brazil today is Jair Macias Bolsonaro. Here again, Brazil is trying to cut its ties, not just with Europe and Portugal, but even cutting its ties with the Catholic Church. When you go to Rio and Sao Paulo and all the old cities of Brazil, you always have the old Portuguese Catholic cathedral centrally located. Well, Bolsonaro is out to shatter the power of the Catholic Church. He, as his middle name, Messiah, indicates he is of a new religion. This is the evangelical Christian movement. That's why Bolsonaro and Donald Trump got along so well. They both had the support of the evangelical Christians. Now, on the left, you see the presidential palace. Once again, beautiful ultra-modern architecture. And that's right on the main um, a, a big giant park running through the body of the butterfly. Now, Brazil and Brasilia are rejecting everything that is European and charting their own course. As of the moment I'm speaking, about 50% of Brazilians are now evangelical Protestants, rejecting the Catholic Church, rejecting Europe and Portugal. The most powerful evangelical church is the Igreja Universal do Reino de Dios, or the Universal Church of the Reign of God. And here you see Edir Macedo, the founder of the church. He's the one who built the giant Temple of Solomon to welcome the returning Messiah to Brazil. On the right, you see one of his churches. My God, that looks like a football stadium or something. But that is the evangelical church, which is sweeping Brazil. Everywhere I went in Brasilia, Sao Paulo, Rio, there were churches built by Edir Macedo. Now, their theology is expecting the imminent return of Jesus as the second Messiah. And of course, he's going to return to Brazil. Now, in addition to charting a new identity for Brazil, Brasilia was also built as the first step to conquering the Amazon. Now, Today, we read about giant tracts of land being burned 
in uh, um, Brazil to make way for agriculture and um, uh, development. That is the case. Every once in a while in Brazil, you get this black cloud coming over the city because they were burning a giant area in the Amazon, preparing it for agriculture, and the smoke would be blowing over Brasilia. On the right, you see the extent of the Amazon Valley. My dream is to fly to Quito, Ecuador, cross the Andes Mountains down to Iquitos, which is in um, Peru, get on a boat and go down Iquitos through Manaus, the whole way down to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, everybody tells me it's filled with mosquitoes and crocodiles and piranha fish. Don't fall in the water. But still, it is one of my dreams, maybe January vacation sometime in the future. But this is, you look at the map on the right, you see Brasilia right at the door of the Amazon Valley, one of the great rivers of the world rivaling the Mississippi and the Nile and the Rhine and the great rivers, the Yellow River of China. So that is another function of building the brand new capital, the gateway to the Amazon. And here you see some of the be beginning, the giant highways from Rio and Sao Paulo and stuff on the coast going into the jungle up to um, Puerto Velho, uh, Rio Blanco, and across to the Pacific Ocean. This is the world's greatest development plan on the face of the earth. More acres, more thousands of square miles are being harvested the wood and turned over to agriculture. As you can see on the picture on the right, huge areas of jungle totally demolished and massive giant uh, agricultural plows and harvesters uh, harvesting soybeans. Large areas which can't be farmed easily are turned over to cattle grazing. On the left, you see the giant highways coursing through the jungle. Well, it looks like forests there, but when you're taking a bus like I did and we're going along one of these highways, you'll see that the forests are being grazed by cattle. Brazil is the largest exporter of meat in the world. I mean, it has gone far beyond the United States or Russia or Argentina. So it is the, for Brasilia was the door to opening up the interior. Uh, that picture on the left, I didn't take that. Those I got from Google images, but you just see the extent of land I mean, a couple areas which were rocky or hilly or swampy or something, they just didn't bother with. And they left some forests there where you still get some animals living. But the vast areas from horizon to horizon. I remember uh, in, uh, I was traveling, this is before this trip, in Argentina and Paraguay and Brazil, same situation. I would get on a bus in the morning and doze off wake up, look out the window, and I'd see a scene like I see on the left or at the bottom. I'd fall asleep for three hours, wake up again, look out the window, and it was the same scene. I thought the bus had not moved, but then I looked, it was hours later, and we had gone hundreds of miles, but this is the breadbasket of the world and growing so. Huge cattle, now these are tropical cattle. You can see they have the hump on the back because they have the ability to resist jungle insects and uh, viruses better than the Holstein cattle and those kinds, which we have in the United States, which flourish in Northern colder climates. But these are specially adapted across between Indian, African and um, other cattle purposely um, bred to flourish in this jungle area. 
Global warming, Brazil is contributing mightily to global warming. I mean, like I said, you would smell smoke and fire uh, almost every day coming from some direction. Also, the building of Brasilia and the opening of the Amazon has wreaked havoc on the indigenous people. Here again, tribes in the middle of the jungle are now exposed to Western diseases, where they had been so isolated since the arrival of the Spanish and Portuguese, they st were still totally unable to react to these diseases. Entire tribes are being uh, wiped out by disease. The farmers, the ranchers, industrialists, real estate speculators, are moving in and nobody is really doing much to protect the tribes. In fact, many people say this is one of the greatest genocides of the modern era. Now, what Brasilia represented as a new city launching a new national identity launching a new country, independent of old Europe, separate from the United States and Asia and the Middle East, launching a new culture. And this example of Brasilia being the symbol of the new age has been copied by many, many countries. On the left, you see the new man, which the fascists uh, in Italy and Germany uh, heralded. The new future, creating a new civilization and a new man. The Marxist plan to create the new man under the leadership of Stalin, who would neither be Jewish or, or Orthodox Christian or Jewish or Muslim, but it would be the new socialist man. Here in Long Island, we had the same thing with the building of Levittown after World War II. This is the young soldiers came back, married their sweetheart, moved to Levittown, giant city within a city, 17,000 homes, population of 70,000, a planned neighborhood. That's where you got your suburban churches with a giant parking lot. You got your famous Jewish shul with a pool, meaning synagogue with a pool, swimming pool, and basketball courts were more interested than the synagogue itself. So humans have always dreamed of a utopia, a new human in a new glorious city or urban uh, development. Now, the far man who was an anthropologist um, who envisaged the new Brazilian, cut off from Portugal, cut off from its African slave pasts, no longer immigrants, whether they're Japanese or German or Italian or Portuguese, but the forging of a new Brazilian, uniting native Indians, Portuguese, immigrants from everywhere in the world, Brazil has the largest Japanese population outside of Japan. And so his book, Amarja dos Utopias, in 1953, was a blueprint for the creation of the new Brazilian man and woman in this new city. And in Brasilia, it's impressive, the number of statues here on the right, you see the Supreme Court of Brazil, once again, with the blind justice. In front of the cathedral, you see great Brazilian saints and mystics. On the left, you see again, the abstracted figure of the new man, the new woman that was being forged in this brand new city. Here we see the National Museum. I mean, it looks like a flying saucer just landed or could just take off and take the new man from his new utopia to another planet to spread the culture. 
This is ultra modern. In fact, books have been written about um, uh, the Brazilian modernist architecture and sculpture. So Brazil, Brasilia was very much a part of this great utopian vision that was shared by groups such as the communists and the fascists, but which was shared by a lot of countries seeking to forge a new future. Imagine Tel Aviv as forging a new Jewish civilization free of rabbis and synagogues and European ghettos, revitalizing a new language, Hebrew language, building uh, new buildings in the Bauhaus style. What does Tel Aviv mean? The city of spring, a new spring for an ancient people. Brasilia was very much the same thing, a new spring for a new civilization. Now, Brazil is not the only country that decided to pioneer this new future by building a brand new city. At the same time, Brasilia was being staked out and built in Nigeria. See the map on the right. The northern half of Nigeria is Muslim. The southern half is Christian and animist. So the Nigerians said, well, our capital city, Lagos, on the coast was built by the British. We want an inland city, a city in the middle of the country, which can unite Muslims and Christians, transcend our divisive histories, and launch Nigeria, the most populous country in Africa, into its glorious future. So on the left, you see a mosque in Abuja, the new capital, ultra modern. On the right, another postcard, fantastic ultra modern architecture. Say, turn our back on the past and launch Nigeria into a glorious utopian future. Another capital city. Astana, built in the middle of the desert of Kazakhstan. If you look at the map on the right, you see Kazakhstan. That got its independence from Russia in the 1990s, declared its independence and decided to build a brand new city in the middle of the desert. Look how flat it is on the left. But striking architecture, turning their back on Russia, and on their ancient history, making Kazakhstan a major world power of the future. Look at the striking architecture on the right. I mean, um, something that would be rival anything in China um, in its um, audacity of architecture. Well, let's bring this whole story home. Now, all of this in Astana and Abuja and Brasilia and all these new cities looking toward the future. Well, the United States did exactly the same thing. Think back in 1776, we declared independence, we won the war. Well, we had the mercantile business elite of the Northern colonies. We had Puritans in Massachusetts, Quakers in Pennsylvania, Dutch in Pennsylvania. We had Dutch Christians and English in New York. The Presbyterians ran New Jersey. Maryland was predominantly Catholic. And in the South, from Virginia to Georgia, you had your slave owning plantations. How was George Washington ever going to unite these 13 colonies and create one nation out of such diversity. What did he do? I'm going to build a new city, halfway between the North, halfway between the South. It is not going to be Puritan or Quaker or Catholic or Jewish or Muslim. We are going back to ancient Greece and Rome the birthplace of democracy. So we could put aside our religious, racial, ethnic, 
cultural linguistic differences in the 13 colonies, and we could create a new empire. Don't forget it was George Washington who called New York City the Empire City, but he designed uh, with Pierre L'Enfant the city of Washington to unite the 13 colonies. So what Brazil is doing in using a utopian city to give a very clear political message and a cultural orientation toward the future, many countries have done that. And Washington DC, our own Washington DC, is a perfect example of using a new city to announce a new age. Now, I'm going to be following up on this series because in February on the 19th, I'm going to be talking about another person who decided to carve a brand new city out of the swamp and to announce the world, the arrival of Russia as a major world empire. So on February 19th, I'm going to be talking about St. Petersburg. And then in March, March 12th, another artificial city created out of sand, and that is Dubai. Ultra-modern architecture, the tallest building in the world, over 200 floors. Once again, using a new city, the power of architecture, to herald the rise of the Arab Muslim world as a major world power. So with this background on Brasilia, charting the way into an unknown future, we will continue with St. Petersburg and then on to Dubai.